Hello, everybody. Welcome to part 8B of the Magdalene Manuscript. If you missed part 8A, I will place that video down in the description box below, along with the full playlist titled Understanding the Magdalene. Today, we're starting off with this section on tantric yoga. Tantric yoga is an ancient system of personal transformation that uses sexual energies to develop spiritual illumination. Now, if you joined us last week, I did, I think I did briefly mention that the two big philosophies of yoga are the Patanjali system and the tantric system. And as I said last week, I personally have been practicing and studied in India, India under the Patanjali system, which is more of a singular system of working on yourself. Um, however, at this point, I am pushing forward more into the tantric system. All of the energy pathways, the shashumna, the chakras, the bandhas, all of that kind of stuff is the same in both systems because it's dealing with the same body. It's just using a different modality to open and align those pathways and those systems of energy. It, its roots reach back thousands of years into India's past, and its goals are nothing short of divine transformation. Under the spell of Tantra, a man become transformed into a god, while his consort is likewise transformed into a goddess. Tantra calls the divine into this world through temporary embodiment in its tantricas, those who practice Tantra. And it's at this potent joining of the divine and the human worlds that make this type of yoga so powerful. This kind of yoga demands arduous training and is fraught with danger. Yes, I think I've actually spoken about this a lot in this series about the dangers in really any spiritual practice. This is why it's super important to have a teacher. You always need a teacher. You need somebody to keep you humble and to show you where your blind spots are. Those blind spots are typically triggered by the ego. And the ego has the ability to make the wisest of men look like fools. The ego itself is the illusionary sense of self, not the true sense of self. The ego is the one that carries fear and pride. And so the ego tends to creep up a lot in yoga practices. Now, if the yoga practice, regardless of what it is, is practiced properly, it will actually trigger the ego to arise. However, if the student is diligent and has a really good teacher or guide, once that ego arises, that gives the student the opportunity to transmute that ego into the divine consciousness of soul. So this is why, though, yoga practices can be dangerous if put into the wrong hands, because if the person is not willing to confront their ego or if they don't have a teacher and they're just blindly doing this stuff, it can actually explode the ego and keep the ego in a higher place of narcissism versus a humble place of soul consciousness. All right, so let's read that again. This kind of yoga demands arduous training and is fraught with danger. Unless the energies of sex are mastered appropriately, one will not attain the promised liberation of consciousness. One will instead be deluded by the heat of one's own passion. Indeed, there are ancient cautions regarding this path of yoga. It is not suitable for everyone. Only those who can enter the fires of sexual passion with sobriety and detachment should attempt it. This type of tantra is a far cry from the weekend tantric workshops so powerful in the West. Yeah, you have to be really careful again with um, workshops and stuff like that. Uh, it's so funny. Um, I had to block someone because they told me that somebody asked, how do you find a knowledgeable teacher, which you literally need to look at their bio. You need to see what their lineage is and who their teacher is. If they don't have a teacher on their bio or if they're just claiming they went through a teacher training or like the Yoga Alliance, then I would stay clear of that teacher. You need somebody who actually has a name of a teacher on their bio, someone that they are accountable to. Well, somebody said that I didn't know what I was talking about, which LOL, I've spent years in India studying at one of the most sought after institutes in the country of India. So I actually do know what I'm talking about. I have the education to back this. And um, yeah, you have to be very, very, very careful of westernized yoga. You know, vinyasa flow, those kind of practices do have their place. They can be fun, but you just have to understand what you're getting into. And you have to understand that there is a pure form of yoga and then there is a diluted form of yoga. And you have to be very, very, very careful. And that's where you have to learn how to use your critical thinking skills and your discernment. 
right? So like if you go take vinyasa flow classes, they can be fun and you can get some benefit from them, but you also have to understand that they're not traditional yoga classes, right? And I think when we understand that, when we actually have that understanding, we can enjoy things more because we're not expecting something that the practice or that class in particular isn't going to give us, you know, if that makes sense, like it's just there for fun and it's just there to experience. And again, the greatest, as I said, in the live we did over yoga, the greatest teacher is you. So even though people are so fraught with anxiety about making sure they pick the right yoga class, as I said, in that live, I can only tell you what I know and my experiences. If you mistakenly go to a wrong yoga class and you learn from that situation, then that's wisdom. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. Just just have discernment and try not to get swept up into anything that is going to require you to sacrifice your own discernment, your own sovereignty, and your own critical thinking skills. All right. Tantra is a term that means energy practice, and it can be applied to either sexual practices or, as we will see in the section on Buddhist alchemy, it can refer to the energy practices of consciousness itself as in meditation. Samadhi. So samadhi is one of the lamb, limbs of the Patanjali system. There's eight limbs. It's where the ashtanga comes from. Ashto is eight, tanga limbs, the eight limbs. Samadhi, like was one of my teachers says, samadhi with a capital S is divine union with source, like totally in union with source. And most of us will never truly maintain that samadhi will come in and out of it. But then you also have samadhi with a lowercase s where you have a little bit of a, a flash of that. Sorry, my, my dog just entered the room. He has a habit of, he knows how to open the door. So if y'all heard that, he just entered the room. Um, but anyway, he's from India. He's he's a, he's from India. He knows what I'm talking about. Um, and so the, this, the samadhi with the lowercase s is when you have just these like pratibha moments, these flat, it's the Sanskrit word for flash of illumination, this pratibha where you see something just for a moment and then it, you come back down into that centralized human awareness, if that makes sense. So let's go ahead and read what he has to say about samadhi. The central piece critical to most alchemical yogas, like Tantra, is the attainment of samadhi. By alchemical yogas, I mean those yoga systems that work with the transformation of consciousness through alchemical means. Not all yogas do this. For instance, tantric yoga is an alchemical system in that the subtle energies of sex are transformed through alchemical meditation. Meditation. Raja yoga, on the other hand, is a philosophical pursuit that may lead to a type of enlightenment, but does not impart alchemical methods along the way. Raja means fire. The attainment of samadhi or inner attention allows the yogi to explore his or her inner worlds. During successful meditation practice, the mind turns away from the physical senses. One focus instead upon consciousness, chitta itself. So you guys have probably heard me word the use chitta the word chitta before. The second sutra of the first pada of Patanjali's yoga sutras is yoga chitta vritti narodaha. So chitta is like mind stuff. I think that's the literal translation is mind stuff. Vritti is thoughts. So it's like the idea that when, if you drop a pedal, a pebble into the water and the waves trickle out, that so is what happens with your mind too. So once the, the mind stuff, the chitta creates thought, it then trickles out throughout the whole body and out from the body. And so Narodaha means nothingness. So basically the second sutra of the Yoga Sutras is saying is that yoga is the nothingness. It's finding the no thought. It's not silencing the mind as a lot of um, people like to translate it as yoga is silencing the mind. No, it's actually removing the thought, which is not technically possible. It's like the unsolvable riddle, the unattainable unicorn. But that's the practice is to literally try to cease your thoughts because your thoughts are what's screwing you up right and so he's talking about when he says chitta he's talking about the mind stuff there are innumerable ways to attain samadhi some of them involve concentration mantras words of power yantras visual uh, geometries and pranayama breath control to name a few i would definitely suggest with pranayama though so in traditional yoga you don't even, you're not even allowed to study pranayama until you've completed second series, which takes about 10 years to complete. Extreme pranayama or breath classes, breath work classes are very, very intense. Um, I dread them when I have to take them. I would rather do TikToks and put my leg behind my head for hours at a time and do deep backbending before I take a pranayama classes. Uh, it, it's, it's very triggering. 
Um, I know somebody who actually blinded themselves for a few days because of an intense breathing practice, but it also is very important. But so I would say if you are interested in studying pranayama breath work, I would definitely just be very aware of your nervous system. Um, the reason why in traditional yoga, you have to complete second series is because first series is physical therapy, second series is nerve therapy. So, so they want the body to be in a pristine condition in order to take on this grueling form of breathing. Uh, prana is life force, yama is extension. So pranayama basically means extending one's life force through breath. Here in the Western world, we often say that our days are numbered, that God knows the day that we, we die. Well, in India, in their culture, they say that we are given X amount of breaths to breathe. So we only have so many breaths to breathe. And once we breathe our last breath, that's when we leave the earth plane. And so that makes more sense with the extension of life through retention of breath. All right. There are varying degrees of samadhi depending upon the depth and phenomenon that arises within in the mind. In some states of samadhi, for instance, there is simply a deep sense of calm and inner peace. The yogi in such meditative states might also see lights in his or her inner mind or experience other sensory displays seemingly without stimulation. In other words, arising spontaneously from the mind. In deeper states of samadhi, the sense of a separate self may altogether disappear and be replaced by an awareness of a pure being sat without thought. As the yogi enters these deeper states of samadhi, there is often an arising bliss or ecstasy since the nature of consciousness itself is bliss, ananda. Um, I want to say something too, and I understand why he's using the word yogi because it's just a noun he's using to describe this dude, the person who's practicing this. But something that's really important for people to understand, I'm not a yogi. I'm a student of yoga. And that's all I really am. That's all anybody really is. Once you hit samadhi permanently, that state of enlightenment, then you are a yogi. A yogi does not need the practice of yoga. All right. So to call yourself a yogi when you haven't um, attained enlightenment is actually uh, dishonest. So I try to be very careful about that. Like I'm, there is a yogi inside all of us. There is that enlightenment inside all of us, but I myself am still practicing to find it. So um, even my teacher doesn't call himself a yogi and he's the farm guru. So just be very careful with these words, understand what they mean and where they're coming from, just to keep yourself honest and integral in your speech, because our words are powerful. All right, kumbhaka and the suspension of breathing. As the yogi enters these deeper samadhis, there is a spont spontaneous retention of breath called kumbhaka. In this fascinating interplay between body and mind, the breath is suspended. And as long as the yogi stays in deeper states of samadhi, there is no need to breathe. Yeah, this is why pranayama, he's correct, the breath retention. That's why I hate pranayama is because you get, you have to sit in these particular positions where you're pulling in all your abundas and you're literally holding your breath for a very, very long period of time and keeping your eyes and mind focused. That's why, again, um, to take pranayama classes, just be very aware of your physical fitness and your nervous system fitness. If you are overweight, um, if, if you are not physically fit, um, if your nervous system is a little fried right now, I would definitely, from my professional experience, recommend that you not even think about pranayama classes yet. Get your physical body ready first. Get your vessel ready in order to do pranayama classes because this is your health and this is serious. So just make sure like an athlete has to be prepared for their event. You need to have your body prepared for this event. So that is something I would truly recommend is just really tune in and be honest with yourself about where you are physically before you start doing something like a pranayama class. When the awareness of the yogi shifts out of samadhi, however, into the awareness of the physical senses, the bo body spontaneously takes breath. There are well-documented cases of samadhi lasting several hours or days with this attainment suspension of breathing. Yes. The ph phenomenon of kumbhaka is remarkably similar to the effects of the Tao Taoist stillness practices in which the practitioner enters a timeless state of mind and the breath becomes very shallow or stops altogether. When we get to the se section of Taoism, I will talk about personally striking experience with the stillness practice, so I won't go into it here. But I will say that every one of the alchemical streams has its own method for entering stillness of mind. There is due to the simple fact that without stillness of mind, many inner alchemical reactions simply do not take place. The practice of meditation and the entering into samadhi brings with them many developments of the psyche. 
One of these is the greater sensitivity to and awareness to subtle energies. This development of sensitivity is crucial for the alchemist for the alchemist to develop since one cannot contain in the alchemical container of awareness what one is not aware of. Alterations in time and space. Next, we come to a common element experienced by all al alchemists regarding to the stream in which they are practicing, the alteration of perceived time and space. While in Samadhi, yogis experience a powerful alteration in their sense of both time and space. I believe this is due to radical shifts in brain function. Meditative states greatly increase alpha and or theta activity. In these relaxed brain states, time seems more fluid and space often takes on a strange attributes. What might last an hour in linear time may be experienced as lasting for eons or for just a moment. Yogis also report space being affected. They might experience themselves as very large, like the size of a galaxy, or very small, like the size of an atom. They might feel as if they are spinning or floating. These types of phenomena are, by the way, reported by practitioners of all the alchemical streams. The three gunas. I, I teach courses on the gunas, to be honest with you guys. This is a huge part of the yoga practice. The three gunas. There is another reason meditation and attainment of samadhi is crucial to practice to the practice of alchemical yogas, including Tantra. I call them the three stooges, but the sacred writings of India call them the three gunas. The three gunas are subatomic forces responsible, according to yogic philosophy, for everything that exists. That is true. In creation, they are symbolically represented by Hindi trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. The first of these forces is called Raja fire, meaning king, and is responsible for starting an action. Yeah, so that's the fire of starting action. It is associated with the god Brahma, who created the universe by uttering the sound of Alm. His consort is the goddess Saraswati, who is associated with the arts and with sciences. The second of these forces is called Sattva and sustains an action. It is associated with the god Vishnu, who is responsible for sustaining creation. His consort, a female counterpart, is Lakshmi, who bestows wealth and beauty. So he's kind of got them out of order here. Um, I'm just going to say this as a professional. Um, Sattva is the last one of the gunas a student should um, study. Because sattva, like, like if you're following an uh, Ayurvedic diet, if you're eating for your dosha, then you're eating sattvic foods, like balanced, right? It's very balanced. And so sattva can't exist without raja or tamas, which we're going to get to next. So when I teach my courses and how it's been taught to me in India is you, you don't even want to touch sattva until the student actually understands raja and tamas, because those two kind of meet at the pinnacle of sattva, if that makes sense. Another interesting thing about Lakshmi is that, yeah, nowadays she's associated with wealth and beauty, but that's not her original purpose, not material wealth. Her original purpose was spiritual wealth. And again, this is where sometimes I think Westerners really fuck up when it comes to Hindu mythology and Hindu teachings. For example, a lot of people in the West believe that Hinduism is a multi-god religion, and it's, it's not. It's a monotheistic religion. Um, it has a tri-head just like Christianity does. And basically, the only difference is the Hindus believe that God has come down many times in many different avatars. Whereas Christians believe God has come one time in one avatar. So there's a lot of similarities there. And so we just have to really educate ourselves on the truth and not kind of be acting as monkey see monkey do when it comes to some of these ideas. All right. The last guna is Tamas. This is the rather unfashionable guna is and is responsible for ending an action. It is also associated with Shiva, the Lord of death. Shiva is also the Lord and protector of yogis. His consort is Pravati the cosmic mother of Ganesh, the destroyer of obstacles. So let's talk about this as well. I saw somebody commenting on the Nataraja that it's outside of CERN. That is Shiva. That's Shiva dancing. And yes, Shiva is the Lord of destruction, but Shiva is also the God of meditation. This is why he represents Tamas. Tamas is very lethargic. Tamas is very kappa. It's very heavy. It's very tired. It's very relaxed. In the story, I believe it was a thousand years that Shiva sat and meditated for. Shiva is also the god that's responsible for um, herbs, smoking them. Um, and if you're ever in India for Shiva Ratri, which is the holiday of Shiva, the whole place stinks. It is like 
like a freaking widespread panic concert. Like it is everywhere because that is what Shiva did. He calmed, he's very calm, even though he was responsible for death and for destruction. He was also very, very, very calm. And Ganesh himself is not the destroyer of obstacles. That's, that's more Kali. Kali Ma is more the destroyer of obstacles. Ganesh is a little bit lighter than that. Ganesh is the remover of obstacles and the bringer of obstacles. And Ganesh himself is not uh, an elephant. He only has an elephant head. He has the body of a little boy and the head of an elephant. And this, there's a story behind it, uh, why his head changed. I won't get into it here on this, this because it's not about, this is not a book about Ganesh. But um, Ganesh is, is not really destroying obstacles. Again, that's more Kali. Um, he's more just removing and bringing them. And um, again, I have a little Ganesh here. My friend Meena Gupta in India gave this, this little little Ganesh to me. It sits right on my desk right here. Um, yes. Okay. When I talk about Tomas in workshops, I mention that people are sometimes afraid of Shiva, frightened by the endings, but without destruction, there could be no creation. I point out that the three gunas operate at a level of creation, including our breath. The impulse to take a breath in Raja or Brahma, the act of inhale is Sattva or Vishnu, and the act of exhale is Tomas or Shiva. Uh, don't necessarily agree with him on that one. Um, but then again, I don't know who his teachers were. I'm just, I'm just learning from what I learned in India from the source itself. I then tell them to be Brahma by starting to take an inhale. Then I tell them to be Vishnu by continuing the inhale. And then I tell them to avoid becoming Shiva. Whenever they do, they don't destroy their breath. Well, everyone usually starts to laugh at the ludicrous of my ludicrousness of my suggestion. Our body wisdom understands the need for endings, even if our minds do not. So yeah, you can't. This is why sattva should not be taught with raja or tamas. That should be taught separately because if there's too much tamas and not enough raja, there can't be sattva. If there's too much raja and not enough tamas, there can't be sattva. So in my own experience with my own body and my own practice, I have way too much raja. I have way too much fire on vata pitta. I have anxiety. I get overwhelmed. I go, 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 go. I can live off a very, very limited amount of sleep. Um, it's hard. It's really hard for me to relax, like real hard for me to relax. Relaxing for me is organizing myself. That's my relaxation. And so for me, in order to obtain sattva balance, I have to try to pull in more tamas. Okay. So even though there are the three gunas and they all can exist separately on their own, if there is more raja, too much raja in your system, you're not going to find sattva. If there's too, more, too much tamas in your system, you're not going to find sattva. Okay, so we just have to be aware of this. And again, this is really important. It's, that's why it's really important to have a teacher. Okay. And to actually read the, the yoga scripture itself. This isn't yoga scripture. This is just one man's manuscript. Um, get the yoga sutras. Uh, the yoga sutras right here um, talk about the gunas. Okay. So, so get all that get commentary on it. Read tons of commentary on it. Take courses with qualified teachers. Qualified teachers, again, look at their resume. Where do they study? Who is their teacher? All right. According to one of the earliest sacred texts in, in India, the Bhagavad Gita, the three gunas are responsible for Maya or illusion. Yes, that is true. And the Bhagavad Gita is one of my favorite books, hands down. Yoga philosophy states that you and I are deluded. We believe ourselves to be separate beings, but in point of fact, there is only one fundamental consciousness expressing itself through innumerable forms. Your form is only one of them, as is mine. We tend to take ourselves seriously and get upset if someone or something impinges on our little island of self. But all of this is play is the play of Maya. There is no you and there is no me. There is only the play of cosmic forces. The yogi who has attained this detachment state of being is said to have attained God realization or unity consciousness. But this is not just a mental attainment. It is a perceptual attainment as well. One who has attained this unified state of consciousness is no longer deluded by the illusion of Maya. He or she sees through the smoke and mirrors of Maya to the self behind all things. And how is this done, you might ask? Well, we do this by getting the three stooges to go to sleep. To be more yogically correct, we might say by getting the gunas to settle into a space of quint quintessence. If we enter into Samadhi deeply enough, the activity of the gunas within our mind calms down. Discursive self-talk slows down and then stops altogether. Fantasies stop being generated from the deeper layers of the mind, and we enter a state of deep 
coincidence. The three stooges have gone to sleep. Then and only then can we watch, catch a glimpse of our deepest intimate consciousness, the self. Yes and no. So as I said, you can't find sattva if you have too much raja. You can't find sattva if you have too much tamas. So it's about imbalance. When we're imbalanced, when we're in a place of imbalance or dis-ease, then we are not able to find that consciousness because the body, the alchemical makeup of the body is not in alignment with balance. And so it's more about balancing it all and understanding what these little rivers of energy are actually doing to your conscious mind. Because your mo- conscious mind, it's not what they're doing to your conscious mind, it's what your conscious mind is making them do, right? Because the mind is what generates everything. The body is only responding to the mind. So yes and no, yes and no from what he's saying. By entering and re-entering meditation over a long period of time, we can attain various states of samadhi. If we enter the deepest states enough, our minds will be trained to see past the smoke creation of creation. But until we reach this lofty state of mind, we will continue to experience ourselves as separate from each other, victims to the play of maya. To bring us back full circle, the task of yogic meditation is to enter into deeper and deeper states of samadhi. As we re-experience this liberating awareness over and over again, we split through the knot of our desires and are freed from the power of maya. It takes a certain kind of spiritual development to even consider the need for such a radical action. Most people are quite content to pursue their own desires and are simply not interested in seeing behind the illusion. It is crucial to understand that all perception is relative, relative to the state of the perceiver. The state of mind of a yogi who has successfully attained an awareness of the self is very different from the state of mind of someone caught up in the everyday drama of his or her life. Maya is like a television playing a soap opera. Deluded, we continue to watch the show, convinced that it is our lives being played out. The successful yogi is one who has seen that it is just a show and enters the room and turns off the TV. Correct. I, I've u- actually used this example with my in my courses. You are watching your own reality show. That's all you're doing. It's all an illusion. It's all an illusion. And this, of course, again, is where the ego comes into play. Because when the ego is at play, the ego will convince you that it's not an illusion, that it's real. But the conscious soul knows that, no, it's not real. It's just an illusion. It's just something to teach you. It's just a tool, right? And so he is, he is correct about this. In tantric yoga, the yogi harnesses the power of sexuality to leap through the illusion of maya, to turn off the TV of limited mind, if you will. But without the detached awareness of samadhi, a tantrika, someone who practices tantric yoga, can easily be overtaken by passions that arise through sexual contact. The goal of tantra is a type of meditation, not hedonism. The tantrika uses sensations that arise during ritualistic sex as objects of meditation. Without being able to control their passion, tantrikas will not be able to hold the alchemical container of their awareness. Another reason for training in samadhi is that the tantrikas must be able to still the mind enough during the sexual act to directly experience their sensory pleasures as the play of interactions with the three gunas. This takes a very sophisticated level of sensitivity to say the least. And this level of subtle perception can only be attained through experiences with somatic states of awareness as in meditation. So once again, I just want to again, clear up what meditation is. A lot of people have this crazy idea that meditation is sitting down and, and envisioning something. That's not meditation. Meditation is bringing the mind to a one pointed focus. Okay. That's the real word of yoga means focus. The unity is sun yoga. People get confused by that. The real word of yoga just means one pointed focus. So that's why things like mantras are useful and meditation. Um, I use the uh, try meditation, the uh, Tristana method. So my meditation actually is, looks very different than what you might perceive as meditation. I don't do a seated meditation. Um, that's the Ashtanga method is to do the Tristana method, which means breath, dristi, and uh, asana. Asana means a seat for meditation. So like ekapada shirshasana. So let's talk about one leg behind the head pose. It's not a comfortable pose. So you've got your leg behind your head and you're sitting staring at your nose and then you fold and look at your foot. So you're having to keep your eyes focused on that point. Don't close your eyes. Do not, do not, do not ever ever, ever, ever close your eyes in a yoga class. If you are in a yoga class and the teacher tells you to close your eyes, don't ever go back to that class again. That is the complete opposite of what you're supposed to be. When we close our eyes, the mind goes crazy. We get monkey mind. When we're looking around the room, 
the mind is a monkey mind. It's only when we focus on that one pointed dristy and we focus as we're keeping the eyes focused, like I'm focusing right now on the light on my camera. That's a, a, a dristy is that pointed light on my camera. We're holding that focus, we're breathing, and we're in a very uncomfortable asana, a posture. Only then can the mind continue to stay focused and calm the nervous system, system down when all these other sensory sensations are starting to come up within the body. Okay, so with meditation itself, if you think meditation is just sitting there and manifesting something, practicing black magic, you're not practicing yoga. So um, the proper word for manifestation for what is your rightful inheritance is called dharma. You need to try to manifest something that's not within your soul contract is called black magic. All right. So you have to be extremely careful with this. Please educate yourself. Please, 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 please. It's still shocking to me that people are still just taking people's word for it and not researching. That is what this great awakening is about. Learn it for yourself. Research, 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 go to the library, Google, duck, duck, go everything, find multiple sources, find a teacher, see who their teacher was right? We have to start to understand the power of our own understanding instead of just taking someone's word for it. Okay. All right. Taking someone's word for it is what got us in this mess to begin with. All right. Another reason for training in Samadhi is that the Tantrika must be able to still the mind enough during the sexual act to directly experience their sensory pleasures as a play of interaction with the three gunas. This takes a very sophisticated level of sensitivity to say the least. And this level of subtle perception can only be attained through experiences with somatic states of awareness as in meditation. Sexual bliss. Let me be specific here. In the experience of sex, the sensations of pleasure naturally arise. For most of us, this is enough, but not for the tantrika. He or she is not only entering the sexual experience for pleasure, but is also a means to achieve greater spiritual insight and awareness. The side effect of tantra is that the pleasure states far exceed normal kinds of sex, but this is not the goal. I, I have heard that when it's a twin flame union, just like Magdalene and Yashua, that it's very different than a normal union. So I'm kind of interested in, in that. Like, is it something like the body knows and the mind knows that, oh, this person actually parries the same soul as me, which is wild to me. That's still wild to me. But anyway, for the Tantrika, the sensation of four plays are experienced on many, many levels. First of all, the actual physical sensations and the re release of endorphins occur as they do with most of us. But in addition, due to the mental training of the yogi, the sense of pleasure is experienced against a backdrop of mental stillness. Discursive thought has stopped. Fantasies cease to be generated by the subconscious and the practitioner experiences the arising of pleasure in its most subtle aspects. At, at its subtlest level, the practitioner senses the interactions of the three gunas as creators of his, his or her sensory delight. At these very subtle levels of awareness, the slightest touch to a tantric yogi can set off extraordinary cascades of pleasure and bliss. As the brain secretes pleasure hormones such as endorphins and other brain chemicals induced through tantric practice, the tantrika becomes highly alert. They become intoxicated with bliss, but this bliss is not just from a sex act. It comes from making contact with the self, the one behind the one who is experiencing the moment. It is the joining of these two blisses that make Tantra so powerful. And what are these two blisses? They are the bliss of sexual touch and sexual union joined with the bliss of the self, which is by its nature blissful without the need for another. The methods of tantric union are quite varied, but most of them require the yogi to hold his seed, avoiding the ace of cups, as long as possible. This is because the cycles of arousal, sexual tension, and the dissolving of tension without ejaculation propel both the yogi into a powerful altered states of consciousness. This is thus not unusual for yogi to make love with his yogini for several hours at a time. The goal of it's a long time. <laughs> the goal of Tantra, unlock, unlike the act of sex itself, is not to have an orgasm per se, but to experience the vast multidimensional reality of consciousness itself. And again, we've talked about this before. Magdalene spoke about this in her channeling. And this is why it's super important, especially if you're the woman, that you're able to trust the man that you're with. Because I, for me, I know that it would take me a while to be able to be in that position to just totally let go like that. It, it would take a lot, um, a lot of communication, a lot of trust, a lot of 
really getting to know each other. And it probably wouldn't happen like that on the first time. It would probably take some time. So anyway, that's why it's super important to have that trust. Ojas, I hope I'm saying that right. O-J-A-S. Again, Tantra yogi, yoga is not what I studied in India. I studied through the Patanjali system. There's another aspect to Tantra that I should explain. It has to do with the transformation of the essence into enlightenment. This goal of turning the sexual energy into illumination has some very strong correlations to the elements of both Egypt and the Taoist alchemies. In order to explain this, however, I mean to need to discuss yogic anatomy. According to Tantra, there are energy points near the top and somewhat back of the head. It is generally in this area where the hair grows out from its whorl and some of the maples and some males of certain Hindu lineages shave their heads except for a small circle of hair around this area. It is called the Bindu, and it's a kind of energy transformer that it collects the higher frequencies available to the practitioner. Yogis would say that this is where the spirit begins to descend into the master. This energy then steps down its frequency, slows its speed of vibration as it moves down towards the Muladhara, first chakra at the base of the perineum. Here it reaches, reaches its dense state and becomes the sexual fluids of the individual. According to this view, a man's semen and a woman's eggs carry not only their genetic information, but also hold the essence of their spirituality as well. As the male yogi practice alchemical yoga, especially in Tantra, the energetic essence of his semen, as opposed to the semen itself, move upward into the higher brain centers. This spiritual process is, in many regards, the opposite of the Bindu phenomenon in which the spiritual energy of the yogi condenses into his sexual fluids. In this case, the energetic essence of the male sperm are transmitted into higher vibrational energy called ojas. The female has a similar process that arises in herself. Ojas has a very potent effect on consciousness. Yogis who successfully accomplish, accomplish this alchemical distillation universally report radical changes in perception. Their sense of inner light is dramatically increased and there is an increase of spiritual insight. These changes are due, no doubt, to complex alter, alterations in brain chemistry. And there's something I need to say because I think Magdalene is actually urging me to say this. I really want to make this very clear as we talk about tantric uh, finding enlightenment with a partner and, and, and an act of intimacy. I really want to specify that no other human being is going to teach you your self-worth. I have seen people go from partner to partner to partner to partner trying to find who they are. That's always going to be found within you and you alone. And what I want to express from my opinion is that the power of what he's teaching and what's being taught in this manuscript regarding intimacy with a partner can really only be achieved when both partners have a sense of self themselves individually. We've spoken a lot about that, especially with Emmy on the twin flame journey. You know, if a twin flame and, and you, if you and your, if you're the divine feminine and you have a divine masculine out there and you're, you're, you're carrying the same soul and your soul decided to split, or it's the same soul experiencing two incarnations, whatever, whatever it is, it's basically, you're the same soul living your life. Right. But because of that, because of that, your other half, literally, literally your other half within the unity of the soul is going to trigger you more than anybody else in this world. They're also probably going to help you better yourself more than anybody else in this world. And it probably, you will have a more profound relationship with that person more than anybody else in this world, because you are the same soul essence living in sovereignty as two individuals. With that being said, though, the reason why, and this goes back to Plato's, Plato's symposium as well, the reason why People usually meet their twin flames later in life. Like it's not going to be your first husband. It's not going to be your high school sweetheart. It might not even be your second husband. It might not even be your third husband. You usually meet your twin flame late 30s, 40s, 50s, something like that. Usually late 30s is for some people into the 40s, 50s, because you've had a chance to heal yourself. You've had a chance to grow and get wise and work on your own shit. So that when you come into union with that other person, it can be a power for good. It can be a transmutation for good, like an antenna for good for the world, for a vibration for the world, right? We've talked about the solar flash potentially being in intimacy with twins, right? But if you haven't worked on yourself 
So if it is your high school sweetheart, which it's not, it's going to be a shit show. It's going to be disastrous. Right. And so if you're looking at this type of practice as a way to save yourself, you don't need to be looking at this type of practice. You have to save yourself first. You have to figure yourself out first, do the shadow work with yourself first before you can do this with a partner. Okay. I hope that makes sense. All right. Oh, and I, I do, I know that there's a theory out there amongst some truthers that your twin flame is your higher self. That's not correct. It's not correct. Each twin flame has a higher self, but um, to split your soul like that is, is something that happens to older souls, not newer souls. Um, it's, it's a, it's a leap. It's a journey into self-development. So it's every lifetime, every quantum leap you take, you do something else within yourself to challenge yourself more. And so the twin flame phenomenon isn't, not everyone has a twin at this point, they eventually might have a twin, but at this point, if your soul isn't split, your soul isn't split. All right. And so it is not your higher self. Your higher self is specifically your own higher knowledge and knowing right? And your twin also has a higher self, but a twin is literally the same soul living in two different incarnations. Okay. All right. And again, research that for yourself, just as I'm telling you not to take that truthers, that truther who said that is lied about a lot. That truther who said that is an infiltrator. Okay. So um, just do your own research, read Plato's symposium. I read Plato's symposium in my twenties just for shits and giggles, right? It's interesting. It's super interesting. All right. Entering the mythic realm, becoming a divinity. Tantric yogis go through elaborate perceptions of tantric union, including ritualistic bathing, fasting, and meditation. The space for actual tantra is adorned with things of beauty, flowers, fruit, and assorted food, as well as beverages believed to have aphrodisiac properties. Fasting, let me talk about that for a second. I did a video a long time ago, round table about fasting. Before you go fasting yourself, know what your dosha is. If you are vata, you don't need to do no food fasting. It'll drive you crazy. It will have the opposite effect of what fasting is supposed to do. You need to be doing a, a type of fasting where there is food involved, but a certain specific kind of food. So just, again, if you want to fast, find a teacher, find an Ayurvedic practitioner to make sure you're fasting correctly for your energy and for your disposition. All right. A crucial part of advanced tantric union is the transformation of the yogini into embodiment of goddess and the transformation of the male into an embodiment of a god lowercase g. The deities used for this transformation vary according to the lineage that is being practiced, and the methods of metamorphosis are closely guarded. Many of them involve the use of specific mantra, words of power, and hold the vibratory essence of the deity being called upon as well as the yantras, geometric patterns, also related to the deity. In addition, the transformation is aided by complex visualizations and occasionally, though not always, through the use of psychoactive plants. Some lineages of Tantra forbid the use of such drugs since their use during the Tantric rituals can be dangerous. Yeah. Finally, before making love, both Tantrikas envision themselves as to be divine beings. Nothing less than full embodiment of the chosen deities will suffice. At some point, a successful Tantric ritual demands that the yogi be transformed. The change is not imaginary, but is real, as real as the mythical entering in this realm can be. Thus, as the two Tantrikas enter into the inner mysteries of Tantra, they are for all intents and purposes, making love, not with a mortal, but with a divine being. The mythic aspect has immense consequences in terms of its transformational effects. It is a key component in advanced Tantric ritual, and those who practice Tantra without its component will have missed the kernel of this mystery. All right, that's where we're going to end it today. Next week, we will pick up with Taoism. All right, you guys, again, as always, just find a teacher, please. Please, please, please find a teacher if this is something you're interesting in, interested in and do your research, do your research, do your research. All right, guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.